Yes, there is scientific evidence for a real Adam and Eve. Let's take a look now at the evidence from archaeology and genetics. So, why is a literal Adam and Eve fundamental to the Christian faith? What is the evolutionary story known as the out of Africa theory? And just who are mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam? What about genetic discoveries in regards to Noah's family and the Tower of Babel? How do we account for human lifespan and the patriarchs of the Bible? Are humans and chimps closely related? Finally, where do the races of people come from? The opponents of the Christian faith know, to a man, the importance of Adam and Eve. Robert Ingersoll was an agnostic with a dim view of Christianity, but he knew the critical importance of an historical Adam and Eve. He said that after Darwin and Huxley, quote, the Garden of Eden faded away, Adam and Eve fell back to dust, the snake crawled into the grass, and Jehovah became a miserable myth, end quote. Biologist Richard Dawkins pulls no punches when dealing with Christians who also hold to evolution, i.e. theistic evolutionists, stating, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing evolution as the enemy, whereas the more, what shall we say, sophisticated theologians are quite happy to live with evolution. I think they're deluded. I think the evangelicals have got it right in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. Then he goes on to mock the so-called theistic evolutionist. Oh, but of course, the story of Adam and Eve was only ever symbolic, wasn't it? Symbolic? So Jesus had himself tortured and executed for a symbolic sin by a non-existent individual, nobody not brought up in the faith could reach any verdict but barking mad. Face it, Dawkins gets it. Theistic evolution is an insane proposition. Jerry Allen Coyne is an American biologist known for his work on speciation and his commentary on intelligent design. He claims that each of our genes coalesces back to a different ancestor, showing that, as expected, our genetic legacy comes from many different individuals. It does not go back to just two individuals, regardless of when they lived. He states, these are the scientific facts, and unlike the case of Jesus' vir virgin birth and resurrection, we can dismiss a physical Adam and Eve with near scientific certainty. Many Christians also discount the true history of Genesis. A great proponent of theistic evolution is current director of the National Institute of Health, Francis Collins. Collins is also the founder of BioLogos. BioLogos is dedicated to harmonizing evangelical Christianity with scientific truth. Those are his words. He was also leader of the Human Genome Project that cracked the entirety of the human genome. BioLogos for years has been gravely advising their fellow Christians that science rules out belief in a historical first pair of human beings. Collins' 2006 bestseller, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief, said that anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors perhaps 100,000 years ago, long before the apparent Genesis time frame, and originated with a population that numbered something like 10,000, not two individuals. Instead of the traditional belief in the specially created man and woman of Eden, 
who were biologically different from all other creatures, Colin mused. Might Genesis be presenting a, quote, poetic and powerful allegory about God endowing humanity with a special and moral nature? In a recent pro-evolution book, The Language of Science and Faith, Collins and co-author Carl W. Giberson escalate matters, announcing that, unfortunately, the concepts of Adam and Eve as the, first, as the literal first couple and the ancestors of all human beings simply do not fit the evidence. Then there's biblical exegete Daniel C. Harlow. Harlow is professor of biblical and early Jewish studies in the Department of Religion at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Harlow proposed that understandings of the fall may need to be reformulated, and the church must be willing to decouple original sin from the notion that all humans descended from a single pair. In his view, the early chapters of Genesis should probably be regarded as imaginative portrayals of an actual epoch. Whether or not Adam was historical, he asserted, is not central to biblical theology. Paul and Luke may have thought Adam was a literal man because they had no reason not to, he explained. But we have many reasons to interpret Adam as a literary figure. The Adam issue is hardly new. In 1940, C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Problem of Pain, that, quote, for long centuries, God perfected the animal form, which was to become the vehicle of humanity and the image of himself. Lewis thought in the process God eventually caused the new divine consciousness to descend upon this organism, but we do not know how many of these creatures God made, nor how long ago they continued in the paradisal state. Kenneth Raymond Miller is an American cell biologist and molecular biologist, currently professor of biology at Brown University. Miller, who is Roman Catholic, is opposed to creationism, including the intelligent design movement. He has written three books on the subject. Miller has received the Leitari Medal at the University of Notre Dame. In 2017, he received the inaugural St. Albert Award from the Society of Catholic Scientists. He states, we human beings are wholly natural creatures. We are indeed animals. We have our origin in the process of evolution. Just like every other living thing on this planet, we are made out of matter and energy, and it's, a mat it's matter and energy that gave rise to us. But I don't see anything in that formulation which is contradictory to the message we get from all the Abrahamic religions. Miller's theory points to a deity that created a self-sufficient world which functions virtually independently from God's influences. In this view, God used science and physics to create a complex world and then allowed it to evolve on its own. I tell you, that sure sounds like deist philosophy to me. To understand the reigning narrative in the evolutionary version of human origins, we need to understand a little biology, specifically genetics. All living things have DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And whether it comes from you, a pea plant, or your pet rat, it's all the same molecule. It's the order of the letters in the code that makes each organism different. The order of building blocks in a strand of DNA makes up a sequence. We can read a DNA sequence like letters in a book. In fact, we know the sequence of the entire human genome, all three billion letters. That's enough information to fill roughly 
1,200 page books. Contained within the 3 billion letters of the human genome are about 21,000 genes. Mitochondrial DNA is the DNA located in the mitochondria, which are cellular organelles within eukaryotic cells. A eukaryote is any cell or organism that possesses a clearly defined nucleus. Unlike prokaryotic cells, like bacteria, which have no membrane-bound organelles. Mitochondria convert ener chemical energy from food into a form that cells can use called ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. Human mitochondrial DNA was the first significant part of the human genome to be sequenced. This sequencing revealed that the human mitochondrial DNA includes 16,569 base pairs. Mitochondrial DNA permits an examination of the relatedness of populations, and so has become important in anthropology and biogeography. In sexual reproduction, mitochondria are normally inherited exclusively from the mother. The mitochondria in mammalian sperm are usually destroyed by the egg cell after fertilization. So this brings us to what is known as mitochondrial Eve. In 1987, a worldwide survey of human mitochondrial DNA was published by Can, Stone King, and Wilson in Nature magazine. Its main point was that all human mitochondrial DNAs stem from one woman, and that she probably lived around 200,000 years ago in Africa. When the media picked up from Wilson, one of the authors of the paper, that they had found the mitochondrial Eve, or African Eve, the story became a sensation. Have scientists found the mother of us all? The critics of the Eve story saw that the mitochondrial data did not fit with the fossils in the field. So they started voicing several complaints against the mitochondrial data. First off, the researchers used African Americans rather than Africans from Africa to represent native Africans in their study. So they did not get a proper sampling of the true Af African population. They used an inferior method to build a phylogenetic tree. The program gave different results when you entered the data in a different order. The answer was dependent upon the order that the data was entered into the computer, a big problem. Blair Hedges and his group at Penn State found that when the data was entered in different orders, that sometimes some other part of the world was indicated as the place where Eve lived rather than Africa. Why was it so important to them that the first humans were in Africa? My opinion is, one, the Lucy fossil and several other purported human ancestors were found in Africa. And two, it's not where the Bible says we came from. The story of the mitochondrial Eve is not what paleoanthropologists wanted to hear. They did believe that man came from Africa, but they believed it happened one million years ago. If Eve had lived a million years ago, most of the paleoanthropologists would have accepted the idea with open arms because the mitochondrial Eve data would have fit into the data they had. Now it seemed that there were several waves of humans that left Africa. Each wave seems to have taken over the world. Eve must have lived in Africa 200,000 years ago, and then her descendants started migrating out of Africa maybe 100,000 years ago to take over the earth. And all the, other, and all the older man types vanished from the earth without a trace in our genetic record. 
In addition, there is no evidence from the mitochondrial DNA data that Eve's descendants interbred with the older man types at all. The research demonstrated that every human alive today is descended from one woman. The mitochondrial data became part of the out of Africa theory. This theory argues that every living human being is descended from a small group of homo sapiens individuals in Africa who then dispersed into the wider world, meeting and displacing earlier forms such as Neanderthals and Denisovans. Today, the vast majority of scholars have accepted the, that human beings evolved in Africa and migrated outward, likely in multiple dispersals. However, recent evidence has shown that some sexual interaction between Homo sapiens and Denisovans and Neanderthals did occur. Scholars largely agree that our modern species, Homo sapiens, originated in Africa by 195 to 160,000 years ago, although those dates are clearly undergoing revision today. One still controversial site reported in early 2018 is Mislia Cave in Israel, said to contain a Homo maxilla associated with full-fledged Leveloi technology and dated between 177 and 194,000 years ago. Here, this map shows Homo sapiens leaving Africa 60 to 80,000 years ago. Here is another version of the many proposed migration patterns and dates. The whole debate centers on our growing knowledge of human DNA. Now, let's take a look at the male counterpart of mitochondrial Eve, known in the secular world as Y-chromosome Adam. Only men have a Y-chromosome. The Y-chromosome is passed down from father to son, so mutations or point changes in the sequences in the male sex chromosome can trace the male line back to the father of all humans. Secular dates vary dramatically as to when this Adam lived. Evolutionary theory predicts that for any given man, there is a high probability that his paternal line will eventually come to an end. That is to say, one of man's grandsons, great-grandsons, etc., will eventually not have a son. Just ask King Henry VIII about trying to get a male heir. Once the line of direct male heirs ends, all of a man's male descendants thereafter will have inherited their Y chromosome from other men. In fact, it is highly probable that at some point in the past, all men except one possessed Y chromosomes that by now are extinct. All men living now then would have a Y chromosome descended from that one man. This is Y chromosome Adam. The secular story insists that at no time in the past were there only two humans, what we call Adam and Eve. The story, though, is in flux. A 2013 study states, New scientific research using advanced analysis of DNA from all over the world has found that the most recent common ancestor on our father's side, known as Y chromosomal Adam, lived about the same time as the most recent common ancestor on our mother's side, so-called mitochondrial Eve. That period of Adam's lifetime, scientists discovered, was between 120 and 156,000 years ago. This is the very first time scientists have sequenced the entire Y chromosome in the cells of many men to, de to determine our ancestry. Though for some time now, scientists have known that Eve probably lived somewhere between 99 and 148,000 years ago, until now, scientists had not known whether Adam and Eve had lived at the same period. Never do these scientists believe their Adam and Eve were the first humans or that they were man and wife. 
The evolutionary wisdom says there had to be a minimum breeding population for these individuals to evolve from, typically stated as 10,000 individuals. Amongst evolutionists, the timing of this continues to be hotly debated. So, is the out of Africa story true? Let's look at some of the problems with this whole idea. A recent article states, new fossils and discoveries are constantly rewriting the history of modern humans' movements outside of Africa. Only recently, scientists have found evidence that modern humans may have evolved more than 300,000 years ago. This pushes back old estimates by, a, by over 100,000 years. Newly found remains also suggest that the first wave of migration may have occurred 50,000 years earlier than we had initially believed. Multi-regional evolution could see a renewal in popularity as new pieces of the puzzle are added in. Here is a brief comparison of these two theories. The article continues. At the very least, changes to the out of Africa theory are now occurring. You can see here the out of Africa story says 150,000 years ago, migrated out of Africa, no direct descendants from Neanderthals. Whereas this multi-regional hypothesis uh, says that we evolved in the last 2 million years as a single species, Independent, independent appearance of modern traits in different areas. Humans migrated out of Africa, mixing with other humanoids along the way. There is genetic continuity from Neanderthals to humans. Our understanding of the reasons behind the move out of the continent will only deepen as our clarity on the timelines grows. So says the article. This will only happen as more and more fossils are dug up around the world. It looks like human evolution is evolving. A headline in The Independent exclaims, 300,000 year old skulls that look shockingly like ours could rewrite the human origin story. The article admits the fact that when and where our species emerged is a question that anthropologists have struggled with for decades, and scattered clues have suggested the answer lay somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa about 200,000 years ago. New evidence published in the journal Nature challenges this dominant hypothesis. The study by paleoanthropologists described recently discovered Remains indicating the first Homo sapiens appeared 150,000 years earlier than once thought, and in a location on Earth that is very different than Sub-Saharan Africa, namely in a land that is known today as Morocco. Thus, modern humans appeared 350,000 years ago, meaning some of our supposed ancestors could not be our ancestors because they lived contemporaneously with human, modern humans. An article in the New York Times on 4th of December 2013 lays claim to, quote, a baffling 400,000 year old clue to human origins. On this occasion, humanity's indirect ancestry was traced back to Spain during pre-Homo sapiens sapiens times and once again, Denisovan genes are at play. So it appears the same hominid who is most closely linked to the original genes of Australia was wandering around the Spanish countryside some 400,000 years ago, well before any African Homo sapien could be claimed to have stepped in or outside African soil. Quote, Scientists have found the oldest DNA evidence yet of humans' biological history. But instead of neatly clarifying human evolution, the finding is adding new mysteries. The femur bone found in a cave was analyzed by Dr. Matthias Meyer, 
When Dr. Meyer and his colleagues drilled into the femur, they found ancient human DNA inside, just as they had hoped. Quote, Our expectation was that it would be a very early Neanderthal, Dr. Meyer said, but the DNA did not match that of Neanderthals. Dr. Meyer then compared it to the DNA of the Denisovans, the ancient human lineage that he and his colleagues had discovered in Siberia in 2010. He was shocked to find that it was similar. Greg Jeffries contends that the genetic evidence is in stark contradiction to any out of Africa theory, saying, time after time, the many Y chromosome papers released over the last decade stand united in their denial of any African input. But wait, there's more. Nehiwan China research includes new excavations which have led to the recovery of the oldest known stone tools in northern China in a series of layers dating from approximately 1.66 to 1.32 million years ago. The Yuan Mao stone tools and fossil incisor teeth are from a layer dated around 1.7 million years ago. Ages can be determined because calculations of deposition rate in different parts of a sequence are all highly consistent. This implies that the age of the fossils and artifacts within the sediments can be reliably estimated. The oldest known evidence of hominins outside of Africa come from the site of Dimanisi in the Republic of Georgia, one of the most prolific fossil human sites in recent years. The age of the Dimanisi fossils is about 1.85 to 1.75 million years old by their reckoning. But if the China find proves true, early humans would have been hunting and gathering in northeastern China, 8,000 miles from Africa, as far back as 2.1 million years ago. Quote, our discovery means it is necessary now to reconsider the timing of when early humans left Africa, said Robin Donnell of the University of Exeter. According to secular scientists, an ancient relative of modern humans survived into comparatively recent times in Southeast Asia. A new study has revealed Homo erectus evolved around 2 million years ago and was the first known human species to walk fully upright, so the story goes. New dating evidence shows that it survived until just over 100,000 years ago on the Indonesian island of Java, long after it had vanished elsewhere. This means it was still around when our own species was walking the earth. This age is very young for such primitive looking Homo erectus fossils and establishes that the species persisted in Java for well over 1 million years. In the 1990s, one team came up with, quote, unexpectedly young ages for Homo erectus between 53 and 27,000 years ago. This raised the distinct possibility that modern humans overlapped with Homo erectus on the Indonesian island. Why is this especially problematic for the Darwinians? Homo erectus was supposed to have died out hundreds of thousands of years before modern humans evolved. Instead, they were living side by side with Neanderthals and modern humans. More recent findings show evidence of interbreeding or hybridization with all these groups. Basically, there was no, no evolution. By implication, they were varieties of the same human species. By naming these non-white non -white European humans with a different species label, Homo erectus, the evolutionists are acting like racist. They demean people who could sail and travel the world, make tools, and cook their meals. You can almost hear the retort from a Homo erectus chief. Who, who you call in primitive? 
We were hunting mammoths and cooking steaks and potatoes before you were even born. Even worse, the Darwinians challenge credibility by insinuating the upright walking beings with multiple skills never thought of planting a farm, riding a horse, or coming out of caves for hundreds of thousands of years. That challenges everything we know about human ingenuity. Side note, all the Homo erectus fossils ever found could fit in the trunk of a car. The author continues, the findings further underline the shift in thinking this field of study has undergone over the decades. We used to think of human evolution as a progression with a straight line leading from apes to us. This is embodied in the so-called March of Progress illustration, where a stooping chimp-like creature gradually morphs into Homo, homo sapiens, apparently the apex of evolution. These days, we know things are, were far messier. The latest study highlights a mind-boggling truth, that many of the species we thought of as transitional stages in this onward march overlapped with each other, in some cases for hundreds of thousands of years. So you can see that the evolutionist story is literally all over the map. We go back now to 1997, when the first empirical study of mitochondrial DNA was conducted. And this is important. A very interesting study was published in the evolution promoting journal Nature Genetics in 1997. They compared predicted mutation rates with observed mutation rates. Look at these conclusions. The observed substitution rate reported here is very high compared to rates inferred from evolutionary studies. Thus, our observation of the substitution rate, 2.5 per site per million years, is roughly 20-fold higher than would be predicted from phylogenetic analysis. Phylogenetic analysis is a way of estimating evolutionary relationships among organisms. Using the imperial, empirical, i.e. observed rate to calibrate the mitochondrial DNA molecular clock would result in an age of the, mit of the mitochondria most recent common ancestor of only about 6,500 years ago a clearly incompatible, clearly incompatible with the known age of modern humans. More to the point, it was incompatible with the assumed age of modern humans. It remains implausible to explain the known geographic distribution of mitochondrial DNA sequence variation by human migration that occurred only in the last 6,500 years. The evolutionary paradigm of a molecular clock is deeply flawed in that it assumes evolution on a grand scale and literally involves conducting the whole analysis as a hypothetical exercise rather than as an empirical experiment. In contrast, creation scientists and even some secular researchers have taken a straightforward empirical approach without any assumptions about time and the results yield dates of not more than six to 10,000 years ago. Thus, when the mythical evolutionary restrictions are removed and the data are analyzed empirically, biblical timescales are the result. One year later, another secular researcher remarked on this study, stating, regardless of the cause, evolutionists are most concerned about the effect of a faster mutation rate. For example, researchers have calculated that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose mitochondrial DNA was ancestral to that in all living people, lived 100 to 200,000 years ago. Using this new clock, she would be a mere 6,000 years old. The article continued to note that the new findings of faster mutation rates 
pointing to mitochondrial Eve about 6,000 years ago, also contributed to the development of mitochondrial DNA research guidelines used in forensic investigations adopted by the FBI. Now, years later, and using even more mitochondrial data, creation scientists are spectacularly confirming this previously unheralded discovery. A 2015 study, Mitochondrial DNA Variability and Genetic Clocks, reported the mitochondrial mutation rates can accurately be measured in pedigrees to produce a specific clock for that species. When these clocks are calibrated not by evolutionary time scales, but by using the organism's known generation time, a more realistic and unbiased estimate of that creature's genetic clock can be obtained. By comparing these mitochondrial clocks in fruit flies, roundworms, water fleas, and humans, one creation scientist demonstrated that a creation event for all of these organisms, including humans, occurred not more than 10,000 years ago. Other creation scientists also conducted a study into human mitochondrial variation in which they statistically analyzed over 800 different sequences and reconstructed a close approximation of Eve's original mitochondrial ge genome. They found that, quote, the average human being is only about 22 mutations removed from the Eve sequence, although some individuals are as much as 100 mutations removed from Eve. The most recent empirical estimate of the mutation rate in human mitochondria is about 0.5 per generation. Based on this rate, even for the most mutated mitochondrial sequences, it has been determined that it would only require 200 generations, in other words, less than 6,000 years, to accumulate 100 mutations. So this chart here shows on the left in the red what would be expected for DNA differences after 180,000 years based on the out of Africa uh, scenario. In the middle is the range of the predicted by um, creationist of 7 to 16 DNA differences. And then in the green there you see the actual observed differences anywhere from 0 to 32 with an average of 10 putting it right in the ballpark of a predicted creation scenario. Okay, so how does the biblical story of Noah match up with this data? How many mitochondrial DNA lineages were on the ark? The answer, three. Yes, there were four women, but the Bible does not record Noah's wife as having any children after the flood. In this case, girl children. And notice the claim in Genesis 9:19. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. This is a strong indication that Noah's wife did not have more children. We expect a maximum of three mitochondrial lineages in the current world population. It comes as a surprise to most people to hear that there is abundant evidence that the entire human race came from two people just a few thousand years ago, Adam and Eve, that there were, was a serious population crash or bottleneck in the recent past at the time of the flood, and that there was a single dispersal of people across the world after that during the Tower of Babel incident. It surprises them even more to learn that much of this evidence comes from evolutionary scientists. In fact, an abundant testimony to biblical history has been uncovered by modern geneticists. It is there for anyone to see if they know where to look.
Does Holy Scripture give us any indication that there may have been a genetic bottleneck in the past? 1 Peter 3, 19-21 states, Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. Baptism, which cor corresponds to this, now saves you. How many mitochondrial DNA differences would mutations cause during the 4,300 years since Noah? That depends on generation times. At most, a culture where the women typically give birth near age 15 could have produced 115 mitochondrial differences. Adding those to Jensen's eight estimated pre-flood differences gives 123. In a spectacular confirmation of Genesis history, the most diverse human mitochondrial DNA on record actually shows 123 differences. In short, if all peoples descended from three genetically unique mothers, then our mitochondrial sequences should trace back to their three nodes on a tree diagram. Those nodes should have about eight differences between them, plus a strict biblical timeline suggests 123 as the highest number of mitochondrial DNA differences that should be observed today. What do we find? Check, check, and check. These three mitochondrial DNA trends trace all of humanity back to Noah's son's three wives, a striking intersection of biblical history and modern genetics. When research biologist Dr. Nathaniel Jensen plotted hundreds of human mitochondrial DNA sequences onto a tree, tree diagram, the project revealed an obvious pattern. The mitochondrial DNA stemmed from three central trunks or nodes instead of just one. Three trends in Jensen's data suggest that the wives of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, best explain this finding. Jensen first downloaded mitochondrial DNA sequences taken from all major people groups. He then used standard software that arranges the most similar sequences closest together. The result is a tree-like diagram depicting lines of ancestry. Jensen's data show that the human mitochondrial tree has three nodes. Thus, Everyone alive today carries one of three unique ancestral maternal sequences. This fits Genesis' claim that all humans who exist today descended from one of the wives of Noah's sons. Next, is there any evidence of the biblical dispersal of peoples after the Tower of Babel incident? Scripture tells us, and the earth was of one tongue and of the same speech. And when they removed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Senar and dwelt in it. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the, mount, is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Then God said, Come, let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. There are tremendous implications that come from the Babel account. It explains the amazing cultural connectivity of ancient peoples. Things like pyramid building, common flood legends, and ancient non-Christian genealogies that link people back to biblical figures, as in many of the royal houses of pagan northern Europe go back to Japheth, 
the son of Noah. Here is the out of Babel dispersion map with migrations into Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. We turn now to several other important issues in this discussion. If the biblical Adam and Eve story is true history, then how do we explain the claimed 98% plus similarity between chimpanzees and humans? Dr. Tompkins states, the evolution myth says humans and chimpanzees are on close branches of the same tree. Since evolutionists speculate that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor three to six million years ago, their theory requires a human-chimp DNA similarity of 98 to 99%. More recent research tells us what our eyes have always told us. There are huge differences between chimps and humans. The first time they constructed a chimp genome and compared it to humans, they claimed 98.5% DNA similarity. But this was based on cherry-picked regions that were known to be highly similar to human. However, an extensive DNA comparison study published in 2016 revealed two major flaws in their construction of the, of the chimp genome. First, many chimp DNA data sets were likely contaminated with human DNA especially those produced in the first half of the chimpanzee genome project from 2002 to 2005. Second, the chimpanzee genome was deliberately constructed to be more human-like than it really is. University of London's specialist in evolutionary genomics, Dr. Richard Buggs, evaluated the results of an analysis that compared this new chimp version to the human genome and discovered some shocking anti-evolutionary findings. Dr. Buggs reported on, the, on his website that the percentage of nucleotides in the human genome that had one-to-one -one exact matches in the chimpanzee genome was 84.38% and 4.06% had no alignment to the chimp assembly. Assuming the chimpanzee and human genomes are about the same size, this translates to an overall similarity of only about 80%. This outcome is way outside the nearly identical level of 98 to 99% similarity required for human evolution to seem plausible. Next, if the biblical Adam and Eve story is true history, then how do we respond to the claim that humans are gradually improving due to evolution? The Smithsonian website states, human evolution is the lengthy process of change by which people originated from ape-like ancestors. Scientific evidence shows that the physical and behavioral traits shared by all people originated from ape-like ancestors and evolved over a period of approximately six million years. So, does time plus chance plus mutation equal evolution? World-famous geneticist Dr. John Sanford thinks not. He discovered that many mutations are harmful and they do get passed down generation to generation and some mutations are a cause of death. The conclusions of these studies in modeling genetic entropy have been spectacularly confirmed by two additional secular studies based on empirical data that provided the same results, along with a time scale that paralleled biblical history. Both studies examined the amount of rare single nucleotide differences in the protein coding regions of the human genome called the exome. One study analyzed 2,440 individuals and the other 6,515. Over 80% of the rare variability was considered to be harmful, i.e. associated with hereditable disease, and researchers attributed the presence of these mutations to weak purifying selection 
This essentially means that the alleged ability of natural selection to remove these harmful variants from human populations was somehow powerless to do so. The exact same results observed in the computer simulation studies discussed above. One of the research papers stated the maximum likelihood time for accelerated growth was 5,115 years ago. The other paper uncovered a similar timeline which places the beginning of hum human genetic diversification close to the Genesis flood and subsequent dispersion of people groups at the Tower of Babel. Importantly, this recent explosion of rare genetic variants clearly associated with genetic entropy also follows the same pattern of human life expectancy rapidly declining after the flood. DNA mutations can occur and be passed on to the next generation. When these are empirically measured within a family's pedigree, an estimate of the mutation rate can be achieved. Scientists have actually measured this rate in humans in a number of studies and found it to be between 75 and 175 mutations per generation. Using known data about mutation rates, a variety of researchers have used computer simulations to model the accumulation of mutations in the human genome over time. It was found that over 90% of harmful mutations fail to be removed over time and are passed on to subsequent generations. Because this buildup of mutations would eventually reach a critical level, it was postulated that humans would eventually go extinct at a point called error catastrophe. This incessant process of genome degradation over time with each successive generation is called genetic entropy. More amazing, the process of genetic entropy is closely mirrored by the trend of declining human lifespan documented in the Bible, especially in the 4,300 years since the global flood. This graph plots the ages of the descendants of Noah and describes what is known as a decay curve. In, adi uh, in addition to these genetic simulation studies, prominent evolutionists have shown that the problem of mutation accumulation in the human genome is accompanied by the inability of natural selection to remove them, an aspect of genetics completely contrary to evolutionary assumptions. There is a set limit to how long humans will remain genetically viable. Next, if the biblical Adam and Eve story is true, then how do we explain the different races of people? If we all came from Noah's family and then out of Babel, why do we not all look alike? The answer is not all that complicated. We do share most of the genes that affect the way we look. But as people spread out from Babel, they would have done so in small groups. Large populations can hold a lot more genetic diversity than small populations. As people moved uh, spread out, multiple independent genetic bottlenecks would have occurred. High levels of inbreeding would have happened in each of the resulting groups, and this would have continued for generations. This would serve to remove different genetic variants at random from within each of the post-Babel populations. And so each little group would be genetically different from the others. But the degree of difference depends on how small the population was, how long it stayed small, and how much they interacted with their neighbors. All you have to do is add a little bit of mutation to account for things like sickle cell anemia and blue eyes to this scenario, and we have a way to explain the races with no need for millions of years or com common ancestry with chimpanzees. For many years, biblical creationists had been saying that Adam and Eve would be middle brown skin tone. It turned out to be correct. Since most of the variants that affect 
skin, hair, and eye color are found across the world, these must have been in the population prior to when we spread out around the world after Babel. Thus, they must have been on the ark. Thus, they were probably in Adam and Eve. But if you mix all these genes into one person, they would indeed have middle brown skin and hair and brown eyes. The one caveat that we must add is that mutations have certainly happened within the human genome since creation. And color genes are an easy target for mutation because coloration can be changed without killing or harming the animal or person. This is the reason why we see things like white polar bears, brown grizzly bears, and black bears. It is also why we see black chocolate and yellow Labrador retrievers. These coat color variations are caused by changes in the hair color genes of these animals, and humans have very similar genes that control skin, hair, and eye color. National Geographic stated, these twin sisters make us rethink everything we know about race. And here are more siblings. Why does this make them rethink? I suggest it is because they have had a Darwinian evolutionary mindset from their inception in 1888. The first ever study on the skin color of Africans has now been published, and the results are not what most people expected. It turns out that the genes that control both light and dark skin colors are found across the world. In other words, these variants were in the original human population before we spread across the globe. This is exciting news. It means that all people on Earth really are descended from a single source population, which we believe was at Babel. This is not Adam. This boy with a deep, rich skin tone is expressing the maximum amount of melanin. It is unlikely that Adam and Eve would have been this dark. And as in the case with red hair, it is possible that the particular variant that causes this much melanin production was not in Adam and Eve. And we now know why the skin of some people is much darker than others. A new variant of the MFSD12 gene has been identified in the most dark-skinned people from across the world. It acts to increase eumelanin and decrease theomelanin, the main pigments in human skin, hair, and eyes. Since eumelanin is darker than theomelanin, this explains the intense dark skin color of the darkest people. The beautiful melanin-rich skin of Central Africans, many people from Southern India, Native Australians, and people from island Melanesia is the same. This is not Eve. This woman does not produce much eumelanin, the dark brown pigment found in human skin, hair, and eyes. She is, however, showing much theomelanin, hence her reddish coloration. Light color tones would have been hidden in Adam and Eve and the early human population by darker gene variants. Yet since red is not found across the world, there is a possibility that it is caused by a post-Babel mutation. The surprising new finding is that the darker and lighter colors found in different places are caused by the same genetic variants, meaning they existed before people spread out on the earth. Here is a chart of world skin color distribution. What this all means is that there is no genetic basis for racism. Here is a 1932 race poster. This is what I was taught as a kid. This is the biblical truth. Geneticist Sarah Tishkoff states, there is so much diversity in Africans that there is no such thing as an African race. 
And what exactly have these scientific advances taught us about race? According to Tishkoff, that when it comes down to our genes, there simply isn't any such thing. The Bible always claimed that all people were descended from Adam and Eve, and then from Noah and his family in the recent past. Thus, the Bible clearly teaches that there is but one race of people. Modern genetics has shown this to be true. There is also no biblical basis for racism. As Paul states, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Colossians 3.11 if all people have equal standing before Christ, and if people from any culture or racial background can be saved, clearly there are no racial distinctions in God's eyes. Next, if the biblical Adam and Eve story is true history, then how do we explain population growth from six people to seven billion people in only 4,300 years, that being the time of the flood? Actually, we would have gotten to 7 billion sooner if it hadn't been for sin and the flood of judgment on that sin. That event reset the population to eight people where six of them, Shem, Ham, and Japheth's families, were responsible for repopulating the earth. From a biblical perspective, the current human population easily fits into the standard model of population growth using very conservative parameters. In fact, starting with six people and doubling the population every 150 years, it more than accounts for the current human population, a growth rate of less than 0.5% per year. So we must ask the question, why are there so few people in the world today? The answer is that the world is young, and we have not been here more than a few thousand years. At first, scientific and evolutionary theories taught that the human race had no common origin whatsoever, whether from a certain location like Eden or certain common ancestors like Adam and Eve. Now, scientists can't decide where or when humans first lived. Their out-of-Africa theory is sinking like the Titanic. And geneticists have discovered that all humans have a common female ancestor, mitochondrial Eve. And all humans have a common male ancestor, Y-chromosome Adam. And using actual, empirical, observable evidence, our two common ancestors lived at the same time about 6,500 years ago. And there has been plenty of time for the population to grow from two people to seven billion people in the biblical out of Babel story. Adam and Eve matter. To the evolutionist, they must not exist, lest man be considered God's special creation instead of the product of time and chance. To the Christian, Adam must exist, lest the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the grave be considered totally meaningless. We conclude with a few of the church teachings on the subject covered in parts one and two of this three-part series. Recently, I heard an apologist on Catholic Answers Live radio program refer to the early chapters of Genesis as an inspired poem but what does Jesus say about the writings of Moses? If ye believed Moses, ye would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? The doctrine of creation in the fall forms the foundation for the church's understanding of redemption and sanctification. In the light of this truth, it may come as a shock to many to realize that the understanding of creation and the early history of man proclaimed by all the apostles and church fathers differs drastically from that which is being proclaimed in most contemporary Catholic institutions of learning from kindergarten to the postgraduate level. 
So, when does scripture say man originated? At the beginning of creation, during creation week, on day six, just as Moses wrote. When Jesus explains to the Pharisees about the indissolubility of marriage, he says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. St. Thomas Aquinas in Contra Gentilis states, Fourthly, through ignorance of the nature of things and consequently of his own place in the order of the universe, this rational creature, man, who by faith is led to God as his last end, believes that he is subject to other creatures, such as the stars, to which is he is, in fact, superior. It is therefore evident that the opinion is false of those who asserted that it made no difference to the truth of faith what anyone holds about creatures so long as one thinks rightly about God. As Augustine tells us in his book on the origin of the soul, for error concerning creatures by subjecting them to causes other than God spills over into false opinion about God and takes men's minds away from him to whom faith seeks to lead them. The Council of Trent in question 19 stated, lastly, he formed man from the slime of the earth, so created and qualified in body as to be immortal and impassable, not however by the strength of nature, but by the divine gift. But as regards the soul of man, he created it in his own image and likeness, gifted him with free will, and so tempered all his motions and appetites that they should at all times be subject to the control of reason. He then added the admirable gift of original righteousness and next gave him dominion over all other animals. For the sacred history of Genesis, the pastor will easily make himself acquainted with these things for the instruction of the faithful. In Arcanum Divinae, Pope Leo XIII wrote, we record what is to all known and cannot be doubted by any that God on the sixth day of creation, having made man from the slime of the earth and having breathed into his face the breath of life, gave him a companion whom he miraculously took from the side of Adam when he was locked in sleep. The last authoritative declaration of the magisterium was Pope Pius XII's Humani Generis in 1950, where he clearly stated, bishops must teach that all of Genesis 1 to 11 is true history. And, Bishops must teach that the Bible is inerrant in all that it teaches, not just in matters of faith and morals. The literal sense of scripture must be believed unless reason dictates or necessity requires. Folks, the world is adrift because it has forgotten where we come from, why we are here, what the problem is, the solution in Jesus Christ, and where we are going. Let us be among the bold and create, courageous who speak the truth in our families, amongst our friends, and to the world at large. Listen to our first Pope. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For the first time in the Catholic world, we have a comprehensive course fully explaining all these truths of our origins. This series covers scripture, tradition, and science in great detail and should be required study for all Catholics starting in high school. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this talk.